I'm a poet, a bit of a visual artist, educator, publisher, gambler, uh, lover, and a sinner. I can talk about my process when it comes to making these pieces. I've only started making these sculptural assemblages in the last few months. And the way I go about making them is by finding objects, uh, either in alleyways, on the street, and then I just uh, uh, bring them home and collect these things. And then, if there's a chemistry between the pieces, or the junk as I call it, I bring them together and form kind of a scenario a sculptural scenario and it's really about the alchemy between the pieces that I find. I don't really know what I'm communicating uh, necessarily, I just know that they fit and whatever's being represented, uh, again I can't be specific as to what's being represented here. There's certainly a feeling associated with the pieces as for a specific content. I get sometimes a vaguely religious feeling from some of them. Uh, it's almost uh, like the way I construct some of my poetry. I'll find bits and pieces of my writing and then combine them and see if they work, see if there's an alchemy. I'm Luciano Iacobelli. If I'm a little flush, it's because I've uh, been out walking all afternoon. You know, you got to get uh, your exercise uh, in this day and age of COVID. The, the great monster that keeps us isolated uh, and hopefully creative. Actually, this whole COVID journey has uh, forced me to, to make things that I thought I would never make. Uh, an example is the work in front of me. I started using black paint uh, and improvising and I came up with these sort of abstract pieces. Actually, I don't even consider this visual art. Um, I think this is a kind of writing. These are hieroglyphics as far as I'm concerned. and. Um, I'm not quite sure what the hieroglyphics are, are indicating, but um, I, I've done a whole bunch of them. And uh, actually, another name I have for these are noctograms, uh, night writing. Um, and right now, I believe my, my mind is a kind of in a nightly state. Uh, and that it's exploring some kind of a night and recording it. Again, I'm not really sure what's going on. There's generally no direction and I let the materials or the language take me where it needs to go. Um, and again, I never really understand what the significance, especially these, these pieces here. I really don't know what they are about, but I like them. I like them, and maybe I'll frame a couple. It's funny that I consider myself a poet, even though I don't believe that poetry exists yet and that poets exist yet. I think poetry is something on the verge of happening and poets are on the verge of happening when language has the same immediate effect as music. When the words that I speak to you affect you the way music does, that immediacy, then, then we have poetry. And maybe the spoken and the written word can't do that. Maybe poetry is going to have to come some other way and not through 
words. Um, and all what we call poetry now will essentially become obsolete and forgotten. And uh, I kind of look forward to that because uh, even our immortals will be forgotten. Uh, as uh, the great poets of the dead languages have been forgotten. And I kind of celebrate the fact that we're all going to be forgotten because that gives me permission to do whatever I want because it really doesn't matter. Um, and because it doesn't matter, I am free. And because I'm going to be neglected, I am free. So <clears throat> let me indulge. Here, here's another piece, another noctogram. Coal reburies itself. Darkness embraces its original depth. Old body reaches vanishing point. A scented flower on a slope, an impending cancellation without thorns. Lisping lisp. Whisper, closed channels, columns of air support the universe. Star caravans under an arc of ribs travel to where the dead go, beyond the learning curves, into a margin of birds. Unspell the spell, retract wind and waves, pull in the line on which selves dry before they're folded. So even though I do a lot of visual art, my real focus is poetry. And over the last five or six years, my poetry has, has uh, shifted uh, considerably. It's shifted in terms of shape, form, content. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to, to use more uh, of a visual approach to the work. Uh, so in the, in the last, um, let's say, decade or so, um, my work has changed considerably and I've um, introduced a, a graphic component uh, in the work. Uh, I wouldn't actually use the term concrete poetry for this because I think the intent is different. Um, I s this is writing as far as I'm concerned. It's not pictures. Um, I'm just going to flip through these pages and show you what I'm talking about. I believe these can actually be read. Big words stretched to the far meaning. Space and endless watching out has many shores. Endless exhausted invasions. The art asks if the distance is puzzle, where it leads. The bird comes to my table and takes a crumb from my hand, not afraid this time, when other times just the slightest movement of my hand scared it away. Now that's one way of reading that. I th they're designed so that you could read this many other ways. And again, this is, if I were to read this a second time, it would be a different poem. Musical style with my heart composes affections, diminished form, lapsed in bittersweet sentiment I've long outgrown. And I will read it a second time. Will disappear my heart composes her affections her diminished form in taste, a bittersweet sentiment I've long outgrown. I don't title my pieces because um, I would like the reader to think of the book as the piece and that um, you're, you're not reading individual sections but you're reading part of a book. So it, it helps with the notion that this is a continuous piece.
Movement of a fan, the soul is air cooling the face, but flesh is not so easily known. Mystery to itself, internal bleeding is self-investigation. When the blood first appeared, it was streaks, then little drops, then finally black tarry substance, the leakage of growth, outcroppings of a new corpus within the corpus, scan of thorax, abdomen, pelvis, where longitudes and latitudes collide, concuss, now stand as hills and craters. So apart from uh, writing poetry and uh, painting uh, and making assemblages, uh, I've also dabbled in, in publishing over the years. Uh, first with a uh, small uh, mini micro press called Lyrical Miracle and then Quattro Books. Um, although I'm no longer involved with Quattro Books, I still uh, uh, occasionally will uh, make a Lyrical Miracle book. Here's an example of some of the books that I have made. And, and this happens to be one of my favorites, this one here, with a pacifier on the front cover. They're basically handmade books, and um, they're all from, the, the covers are all made from recycled book covers. Uh, I primarily publish poetry, sometimes short stories here and there. Here's a book by uh, Gianna Patriarca. I started making these books uh, when I owned a bookstore. I spent the bulk of my teaching career teaching in a very, um, let's say, open concept type school, uh, a school based on uh, Summerhill. Anyways, at that school, I was uh, able to uh, do all sorts of creative things with my students. And these books emerged from that. Um, I started a creative writing program, and I wanted the kids to actually, uh, at the end of the course, produce a book and to have a launch. Um, and so I came up with this format, and, um, and it, even my adult friends wanted a book at the end. And so I ended up starting a little micropress and, and published some of Toronto's, even Canada's best poets. I actually have a, a book that I, I published by Giorgio De Chico that never saw the light of day, but you can see it at the uh, U of T library. Um, Books by Priscilla Appal, Rushma Dunlap, um, Antonio D'Alfonso, uh, Corrado Paina, Gianna Patriarca. You notice a lot of Italian names there. Um, Len Gasparini. I've had over about 200 authors publish with me. And um, it's a press that still exists. At any time, I can... Oh yes, Brenda Clues, who is my wonderful photographer, published. So there's a lot of uh, Toronto poets uh, that uh, produce chapbooks through me. And uh, a, a perfect way to, to get out new work, exper experimental work. But uh, this led uh, to an uh, even more ambitious form of publishing, uh, Quattro Books, uh, which was started by myself, Alan Breezemaster, Beatrice Hausner and John Calabro. Uh, and we were a subsidized press specializing in uh, the novella, but also poetry. And, and we published some uh, excellent books and uh, had, it was an ongoing concern for about 15 years. And uh, um, I, I was the last remaining member of Quattro Books uh, and uh, because of health reasons couldn't continue but uh, now it's in the capable hands of Bilal Hashmi. Anyways, the mandate behind Quattro was diversity, to, to publish uh, diverse voices uh, in Canadian literature and even diverse genres. Uh, and we, we pretty much stuck to that mandate and, and published close to 200, 300 books. But, you know, Canadian publishing is very difficult. I found that uh, by the end of it, uh, the government uh, was telling me uh, what to publish more and more. Um, 
you know, it starts off as a suggestion, then it becomes a mandate, and uh, you're supposed to publish A, B, C, D, and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes what we published wasn't the best art, uh, although it satisfied sort of a mandate for social justice and diversity. And I kind of had a conflict because at the end, uh, I'm more uh, interested in things being art first, uh, then, then they could be social justice or diversity, but it's got to be art first. Um, but it's a belief that uh, not everybody shares. Anyway, so that's, that's the story of Quattro. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it created a bit of an interest in the novella in, in, um, in Canada. Not enough. Uh, it's, it's a form that's still underappreciated, underused. Although I believe it's the form of the future, considering our attention spans. People require their writing to be more and more concise, more, more and more lean. And the novella fits that perfectly. Here's a, a piece by Roberto Mara. Kind of a scary cover, but I love scary. What's my connection to the Italian-Canadian community, the Italian-Canadian experience? Um, I very seldom talk about it in my work. I generally don't write about specifics like that. I did when I was, was younger, and I prefer to keep those poems unpublished. Poems about uh, family, poems about the neighborhood, uh, poems about being Italian. But as I went on, I realized that um, there were a number of other poets that could uh, cover that territory much, much better than I can. It's in the substratum uh, of the work. It's not explicitly on the surface. There is a lyricism that I've inherited from my background, especially coming uh, from my father uh, and his love of music and opera. So there's always going to be a lyrical component to my work and a sense of, of, of musicality. And it's something I struggle with, uh, this lyricism. At times I want to completely defeat it, um, completely eliminate it. And then I realize that that's impossible and I have to work with it. Uh, and, and that tension characterizes, characterizes my work to a great degree. In terms of the greater Italian culture, um, I've been influenced by people like Marinetti and the Futurists, uh, the Hermetic writers like Montale. Uh, I loved Cesare Pavese and his work, and the visual artists, uh, Di Chirico, uh, Giacometti, who's actually Swiss, by the way, but, uh, you know, he's one of us. Let's put it that way. It's all there. I've, all, I've been exposed to it. I've pursued it. Uh, and it's had a deep impact on my work. As for writing directly about uh, being Italian-Canadian, um, I noticed that there, there is a difference between those writers and poets that were born in Italy and then immigrated here and people like myself who were born here. The people, the writers that immigrated tend to write about a sense of loss, a sense of being misplaced and uprooted. Fair enough. Uh, but my experience the, is not like that at all. This is my native country. This is uh, my place. I don't feel a sense of alienation and a sense of discrimination. I know that uh, uh, I'm sometimes t treated differently because of my name. Uh, people just make assumptions. But it hasn't been traumatic. There's, there's no trauma I'm trying to solve. Uh, no sense of grief or loss that, that I'm fixated on. 
So my work does not deal with, with those problems, those issues connected to, to immigration. Um, and I tend to write about uh, things that are more internal, more, more uh, personal, spiritual things, metaphysical things. Yes, of course, you can't ignore the world. You have to talk about the world um, and it's all there. And that's really my, my, my statement regarding uh, Italianness and, and my work. It's, it's definitely there, uh, but uh, again, it stays underneath the surface. It stays in the substratum. And there's a, a sense of lyricism and, and beauty that's, that's, that comes with the heritage. Sometimes I struggle with that sense but it's always going to be there. This is not child pornography. This is actually um, a little boy trying to hide his genitalia uh, because his pants have been pulled down by some mischievous uncle. And this is in fact a, based on a, a photograph uh, of me I was about four years old at the time, and um, I was an uncle or a cousin, did come up and pull down my pants and then took a snapshot. It looks like I'm playing with myself, but I'm not. I'm actually hiding my wee-wee. Uh, but, but this is interesting. So in my writing, I, I will avoid um, or, or not talk about my background and my past, but in my painting, it's a different story. I have no issues uh, painting ab ab about the past, uh, taking these immigrant photos, you know, and and enlarging them. And um, so I've done a number of paintings like that, where where uh, based on, on photographs that were taken in the 60s mostly. I was painting these in the 80s and 90s. And, and I could see myself doing it again, believe it or not. I mean, it is fascinating. It is an interesting... Era. But on the whole, though, I, 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 um, I'm not painting figuratively. And I'm actually not even painting. I'm more like sculpting and assembling these days. But again, I'm not going to say, you know, uh, that it's done for me painting and that these kind of paintings I'll never do again. But, but there was a time where I was intrigued by, by these photographs. Um, so, in a way, though, this, this epitomizes my experience with, with my background. Uh, I, I found that my childhood was a little on the painful side in that sense, that, that my pants had been pulled down um, by forces greater than myself. And, uh, and that's how I felt about, uh, about my household, that I was the little guy uh, that had no power and that, uh, that I was exposed uh, at the mercy of others. And so maybe that's what incited me to sort of leave the, the neighborhood, leave the family behind and, and go on to different things. Uh, and why I resist uh, dwelling on, on, on that subject matter. So that's this piece. Again, this is not child pornography. Um, when my son looked at this, he thought it was about him because as kids, we actually looked very similar.
This is um, a painting about uh, a birthday party based on a, a photograph taken at, I guess, my fifth or sixth birthday party. Uh, if you look at it, it's a little on the grim side. Uh, there's something very ghostly about this piece. Almost, I think, except for myself and one other person, everybody here is now deceased. Uh, this would be my mother, my uncle, my grandparents, uncles and, and cousins. Uh, so, even though it's a festive occasion, there doesn't seem to be a festive sense in, in this piece. And I suppose that's, again, indicative of how I feel about um, my childhood. Uh, I wanted to sort of always grow up and not be a child. Birthday boy. And you already said that, right? Yes, it's my for, it's my birthday, right? Oh, that's really cool. Uh, that's really cool. But it's funny, you know, when I started painting this, I wanted to actually do a lively and happy painting, but it didn't turn out that way. It just moved in this direction. And there's, there is this sense of the haunted and, and the ghostly in it. And, um, and it's pretty much how I feel about the past. That it is haunted. Haunted by all the things I couldn't do. Uh, and things I couldn't be. Mind you, these were all very loving people. They're, they're, they were good, loving people. Uh, but the love I found constricting. Uh, and I guess as I get older, I, I, I appreciate that, that love even more. As constricting as it may have been, it still was love. And you can't, you can't screw around with that. So I respect. And here's a, a piece based on a photograph of uh, my mother and uh, my two sisters. Uh, it is an attempt at a happier and livelier uh, painting, but nonetheless, there is something uh, haunted and a kind of a sadness uh, in this piece, if you look at the faces, and in particular, this is this image here, um, as if the figure is behind bars, is excluded. That? It's my other sister, but the, in reality, the, the photograph uh, does not include her. I, I included her. I ad edited her here. And it actually doesn't even look like my sister. It could be anybody. It could just be, be a, a, a girl. But in my mind, I, I pictured my sister. But uh, So there is this figure standing in the background that seems to be behind bars, seems to, to be incarcerated in a way, looking out. And again, that, that, that spirit of being incarcerated uh, is uh, indicative of how I felt uh, growing up in my neighborhood, um, being in my family, and just wanting to break out. Uh, and I, I, you know, I may have done it in a cruel way, but I did break out. But... Uh, but still, some of the lyricism I, I'm talking about comes through here. Uh, it does look like a European setting, I, I, I hope, I think. And um, the faces are beautiful, you know. Um, they have that classic sense. My technique might be, not be so great, but um, yeah. So once again, there is 
a kind of a rift between what I'll write about and what I'll paint about. Uh, one uh, art form gives me a permission that the other one does not. And that's, I think, why I do both. It's because they permit different things. So this piece is uh, more indicative of the kind of work I'm doing now. As you can see, it's, it's abstract, although there are some figurative components in it, like letters and, and numbers. Uh, and the piece, as far as I'm concerned, is more, more atmospheric, more open. It invites the viewer to create their own painting. So I'm doing less direction. Uh, the way that I would have in the past where you I would have just given an image and some kind of a narrative and and the viewer has nothing to do except just take what I'm giving in works like this the viewer can actually create through their eyes they can make the piece they can uh, see the arrangements that they want to see yeah I like to use uh, the cheapest materials possible and, uh, uh, and even found materials. Uh, I think I may have even found this canvas, uh, found it in the garbage and painted over it. But yeah, so this is the direction I'm moving in now. I believe it's, it's more internal, more about the spirit and, 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 the, and the self, and again, less it does, it directs the viewer less than, let's say, my, my, my previous work. And this is uh, one of my sculptural pieces. I'm doing more and more of this kind of work these days. It's all found objects. Everything here I found in the garbage except for the espresso pot, which was in my cupboard. Uh, you're handling materials. You're uh, exploring materials and, and objects. This is a saint, as you can see. And I guess uh, to relate this to, to, to being Italian, uh, you can see my Catholicism coming in. And also, you know, you can see how Italian I am uh, through the espresso cup here at the bottom, which is the genitalia of the angel, um, of, of, of the saint. Let me show you my walls. Every apartment I've had, art was everywhere. I congest my apartment with art. I want my walls to talk. There's got to be communication. And I want to feed my walls. And uh, I like making my art these days from things that I find. Assembling. In fact, I think that's what I've been doing for the last few years, is assembling something. I can't put my finger on what I'm assembling. Even in my written work, I assemble. I take from here, I take from there, I put together, I shake it around, something comes out. And I collect the work of my friends because if I can't have, have them here personally, I want a piece of their soul. Here's a piece by my friend Corrado Paina. Here's a piece from Roberto Mara. What's interesting about this piece is the kind of nausea, the way it sort of, the lines break out and you're looking at the viscera of the canvas. Um, and that fascinates me. What's underneath, what's underneath the blank. I don't believe there is emptiness. What's empty is pregnant. And uh, give it a nice cesarean section, and this is what you get. A student gave this to me as a wedding present. I love it. Oh yes, I also have a fascination for uh, indigenous arts, Inuit arts. I'm surprised that we're not deriving more inspiration from work like this. And I wish I could live 
up north with them all year round. No, I'm actually lying there. I want to stay down here in this balmy Mediterranean Toronto weather. A snowy night walk on College Street. I am slave to every introspective flake of this blanketed neighborhood. Cold gust seizes me, and the past blows in my face. Forward steps are a looking back. Norton Avenue, St. Clair and Dufferin. All those dull childhood winters are just salt stains on my pant cuffs. When I stared out the living room window and hoped some large involvement, some engagement, loud and long as a parade, would pass before me. And I stick out the tongue and let memory fall upon it, take in all the childhood snow and all the snow that came after, and from it I rephrase a perfect snowfall. Every neighborhood, every bare tree, every house, every road, every foot canceled, in unmeltable white. Can't remember when exactly. Went to hear a man talk, a famous man I can't remember now, but who had had a very bad stroke and he couldn't speak, couldn't speak for two years, had to learn like a baby basically how to talk. And I remember very little, but he spoke slowly, thinking, careful every word and sometimes stopping seconds, just squeezing out a syllable. It was excruciating. And he read a poem, a long, long poem, mostly because he was so careful and so slow, making many mistakes, this man who climbed out of silence back into words. And the poem, I remember nothing of it at all except the stuttered refrain let, let, let me, let, let, let me loose, let, let, let me loose, loose, let me loose, let me loose, let me loose. I'm going to read a few selections from my book, Noctograms. It's supposed to come out at some point in the fall. And um, I hope it makes me a, a household name all over the world. Um, and that I get the Nobel Prize because of this. Of course, that's not going to happen. And, um, and I want to start again at the beginning. <laughs> that sucked. <laughs>